Welcome to this video series about measuring value creation and private equity, where we talk about how numbers on the income statement, like COGS and SG&A, can explain private equity returns. My name is Mike Reinert. I've worked in the industry for 15 years. I run the Auxilia Mathematical website, and I wrote the book, Private Equity Value Creation Analysis. These videos cover findings from my work website and book, and they're designed for private equity practitioners who use data to raise capital or evaluate the returns of private equity deals, funds, GPs, and investment programs. If it's helpful to you, subscribe and check out the website where you can download Excel files behind every episode. Over the last three videos, we talked about the best way to explain how leverage and growth capital drive private equity returns. Next, we plan to measure how broader market forces influence those returns. Before we do that, however, we need to close out the value drivers on the company's income statement and explain returns with changes in COGS and SG&A. This video will also give us a chance to illustrate an important point about these value creation models. Just because value drivers add up to the correct change in equity value does not prove that the model is meaningful. For example, the conventional model value drivers that we described in VC102 do bridge the gap, but EBITDA growth and multiple expansion in that model are usually wrong because they're not adjusted for gearing. We can make a similar mistake with COGS and SG&A, as we will see in the next section. We know that the derivative model of value creation described in VC104 can explain total equity return as the sum of EBITDA growth, multiple expansion, and the leverage effect using these formulas here. EBITDA growth is driven by EBITDA change, multiple expansion is driven by valuation change, and the leverage effect is driven by equity ratio change. One way to try to work the P&L numbers into this model would be to realize that at any time T, EBITDA can be defined as revenue minus COGS minus SG&A. We can try to substitute this expression into the model where E2 equals R2 minus COGS2 minus SG&A2 and E1 equals R1 minus COGS1 minus SG&A1. When you follow through with all the math, you find that the delta E term is equal to the revenue change minus the cost of goods sold change minus the SG&A change. And if we substitute all these deltas, we get a naive model where EBITDA growth is broken into a revenue growth value driver, a COGS reduction value driver, and an SG&A reduction value driver. It's true that these three value drivers will always add up to EBITDA growth, so they will bridge the gap, but we'll see that this does not tell us very much. Let's look at a company that we've seen before, which grows total equity from 100 to 180, enterprise value from 80 to 100, and EBITDA from 20 to 30 over the holding period. Here we will also grow revenue from 80 to 100, COGS from 32 to 38, and SG&A from 28 to 32. And since we're working in the derivative model framework, we'll expand this table to provide all the differences and averages that we need to run the numbers. Under this model, the 10 million EBITDA increase would generate EBITDA growth of 49.5. The 20 million revenue increase would generate revenue growth of 99 million. The 6 million COGS increase would give us negative COGS reduction, minus 29.7 and the 4 million SG&A increase would give us negative SG&A reduction, minus 19.8. And we see that EBITDA growth is, in fact, equal to the sum of revenue growth, COGS reduction, and SG&A reduction. Now let's look at this on the chart. We see that EBITDA growth of 49.5 makes up about half of total equity value creation. Our revenue growth term is twice that at 99 million, and you start to get the feeling that something is amiss. On a relative basis, revenue only grew by 25% versus EBITDA, which grew by 50%, so it doesn't seem right that revenue should claim twice the value creation as EBITDA growth. The rest of the gap is bridged with large negative changes in COGS and SG&A because those numbers went up. And this also feels off. Those values increase, but they increase more slowly than revenue did, so on a relative basis, they improved. So even though everything adds up to the right number, these value drivers are failing to satisfy our intuition. Further, we also see that they kind of overwhelm the chart, which is also a red flag and a sign that we're off on the wrong track. We need to fix a few things to make these value drivers meaningful. You may have guessed that the right way to do this is to bring the margins into the model. Let's go back to our derivative model starting point. We know that the EBITDA margin is equal to EBITDA divided by revenue, and this allows us to replace EBITDA in our formulas with the product of revenue and EBITDA margin. When we run this through the calculus described in VC104, the EBITDA growth splits up into two new value drivers, one for revenue growth that includes the change in revenue and the average holding period EBITDA margin, and another for EBITDA margin expansion that includes the change in the EBITDA margin and the average holding period revenue. Now, this is the correct spot to introduce the fact that EBITDA equals revenue minus COGS minus SG&A. We plug that into the EBITDA margin formula here. In the numerator, R minus COGS is equal to the gross profit or GP, so we can make that substitution. Then we can split up the gross profit and the SG&A values into two terms that have revenue as a common denominator. 
The first value, gross profit divided by revenue, is the company's gross profit margin or simply gross margin on the P&L. It's a number that's often provided in GP fundraising materials or fund reporting materials, and we'll define it as GM. The second value, SG&A over revenue, is not a common accounting term, but we'll define it here as the operating expense margin, or OM. You will not find this number on the quarterly report, but you can calculate it from the gross margin minus the EBITDA margin. And this means that we can define the EBITDA margin as the gross profit margin minus the operating expense margin. Since this is true, algebra says that it must also be true that the change in the EBITDA margin is equal to the change in the gross profit margin minus the change in the operating expense margin. You can now plug this into the EBITDA margin expansion above, giving us two new value drivers, gross margin expansion, which is driven by an increase in the gross profit margin, and operating margin reduction, which is driven by a decrease in the operating expense margin. Okay, let's do a quick sanity check on these formulas. The EBITDA growth formula says that we create equity value when EBITDA goes up because the delta E number will be positive. We've seen this before, but how does an EBITDA increase happen? Well, one way is to increase revenue. If you could do that without increasing your expenses by the same amount, you will increase EBITDA and create equity value through revenue growth. Another way is to increase the EBITDA margin. That's equal to EBITDA over revenue, so increasing it means that you create additional EBITDA for every dollar of revenue which creates equity value through EBITDA margin expansion. Another way is to improve the company's gross margins. This grows EBITDA because higher numbers mean that COGS absorbs a smaller share of revenue and equity value is created through gross margin expansion. And the final way is to reduce the company's operating expense margin. This grows EBITDA because lower numbers means that SG&A absorbs a smaller share of revenue and equity value is created through operating margin reduction. Okay, this all makes intuitive sense, so let's calculate some values. We'll take the same company that we showed last time, but now add EBITDA margin, gross profit margin, and operating expense margin to the table. And then when we calculate all the deltas and averages, we see that the EBITDA margin goes up by 5%, the gross margin goes up by 2%, and the operating expense margin goes down by 3%. We expect all these movements to drive positive value creation. We already knew that the EBITDA change of 10 gives us EBITDA growth of 49.5. That doesn't change. But now, the inclusion of the average EBITDA margin into the revenue growth formula brings it from $99 million down to a much more reasonable value of 27.2. The 5% increase in EBITDA margin gives us EBITDA margin expansion of 22.3, and as expected, adding up revenue growth and EBITDA margin expansion gives us the total EBITDA growth of 49.5. Further, the 2% increase in gross profit margin gives us gross margin expansion of 8.9, and the 3% decrease in operating expense margin gives us operating margin reduction of 13.4, and these terms add up to EBITDA margin expansion of 22.3. We see that these values give us a much more reasonable looking chart. Here, both revenue growth and EBITDA margin values are contained within EBITDA growth, and also both the gross margin expansion and operating margin reduction values are contained within EBITDA margin expansion. This isn't always the case, and it's perfectly fine to have a positive value driver that's made up of a positive and negative number. We've seen this several times before. The important thing is making sure that they make intuitive sense, and here they do. In this deal, EBITDA grew twice as fast as revenue, and we see that value creation from EBITDA growth is twice the size as value creation from revenue growth. Here are all the value drivers represented in schematic form. The total equity return breaks up into the unlevered return and the leverage effect, the leverage effect breaks into the gearing and cash flow generation. The unlevered return breaks into EBITDA growth and multiple expansion. EBITDA growth breaks up into revenue growth and EBITDA margin expansion. And EBITDA margin expansion breaks up into gross margin expansion and operating margin reduction. This really is the best way to measure how margins and COGS and SG&A drive private equity returns in the derivative model of value creation. Notice that we didn't need to do any calculus on this one. That's because there's a simple addition and subtraction relationship between the EBITDA margin, gross profit margin, and operating expense margin. That simplifies the derivative model, but it tends to complicate things in the logarithmic model, as we shall see in the next section. In this table, we have the derivative model equations for the value drivers discussed in this video. In the logarithmic model, the value drivers are much leaner. These ones only require two numbers. If we tried to do the same thing with the gross profit margin or the operating expense margin, we would get the wrong numbers, so we need to take a different approach. Here's the company that we have been working with, and we can add our equity return multipliers to this table. Let's start with that expression for EBITDA margin change, and then divide everything by the change in the EBITDA margin. 
What this is telling us is that 40% of that 5% change in the EBITDA margin comes from the changes in the gross profit margin. It also tells us that 60% of the 5% change in the EBITDA margin comes from changes in the operating expense margin. And we can use this to separate our equity return multipliers. We know that the EBITDA margin expansion multiplier is 1.2x. To measure how much growth came from the gross profit margin, we can raise this 1.2x to the power of 40%, giving us 1.07x. And to measure how much growth came from the operating expense margin, we can raise 1.2x to the power of 60%, giving us 1.11x. These are the equity return multipliers for gross margin expansion and operating margin reduction. And if we multiply them together, we get the gross margin expansion multiplier of 1.2. You can see that formula generalized here, and you can find a more detailed proof for this on the episode page on the website. Okay, let's sanity check this by converting the equity return multipliers into dollars of absolute value creation. We can do this by multiplying the change in equity value, which in this case is 100 million, by the natural log of the equity return multiplier and dividing it by the natural log of the gross multiple of invested capital, which in this case is 2.25x. When we do that, we get gross margin expansion of 8.99 million and operating margin reduction of 13.49 million. And we see here that these values come really close to those provided by the derivative model of value creation we saw earlier. In this case, they're within 1%. Now, it turns out that there's another way to do this. It won't give you an exact answer, but it will be quite close, and it's often more convenient when measuring value creation in dollars like we're doing here. I show in the book that these equity return multipliers are approximately equal to E raised to the power of either delta GM or minus delta OM divided by the average holding period EBITDA margin. This is convenient because the natural log of E to the X is simply X, so our value creation formulas become the following. When we plug in the numbers, we get gross margin expansion of 8.91 million and operating margin reduction of 13.37 million, again, both of which are in 1% of the derivative model. Okay, with that, here are our value creation starting points in both the derivative model, which gives us value creation in dollars, and the logarithmic model, which gives us value creation in equity return multipliers. As we've mentioned before, the derivative model values are more intuitive, but each of them require more numbers, with at least two numbers for each of the deltas and averages. The logarithmic model values are less intuitive, but easier to calculate. And we see that we start to lose that convenient X2 over X1 form as we go deeper down into the capital structure or the balance sheet. And we have value drivers like gross margin expansion or operating margin reduction that are related to one another by addition and subtraction. All right, that's it for the P&L. Next time, we'll start to look at and measure how these value drivers are influenced by broader market forces. Thanks for watching. If you're into this sort of thing, subscribe and check out the website, Auxilia Mathematica. Registration is free and allows you to download Microsoft Excel files with all the data and charts used in these and other videos. On the site, you'll also find other resources like articles, templates, and a private forum for Q&A. When you visit, check out the site's free online value creation calculators. These web pages allow you to select various analysis parameters, plug in your own capital structure, P&L, and market data, and then measure value creation with a click of a button. I don't think that these calculators will replace your Excel models, but they're really useful for both preliminary investigations and double checking that your own spreadsheets are generating the right numbers. I should mention that if you're looking for a convenient reference and training tool with a form factor of a college text, make sure to check out my book, Private Equity Value Creation Analysis on amazon.com. And finally, if you'd like to get up to speed with models like this more quickly than the book or the website allow, get in touch. Over the last 15 years, I've helped dozens of GPs build models like this for various fundraising and investor relations projects. Thanks for watching and see you next time.